My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramer. Other people make friends. I'm just trying to save a little money. My job is not just to entertain, but to explain this stuff. So call me at 1-800-743-CNBC. Tweet me at Jim Kramer. Will you stop it already with the morning buying? That is what I've been screaming lately right in the camera when I'm on commercial break for the morning show I'm on. Consider these stats where morning buyers have been getting steamrolled, including today, where the Dow opened up 94 points and only finished up just 22, and the S&P declined 0.2% after opening up 9 points, and the Nasdaq lost 0.52%. Yesterday, just looking at the S&P, we opened at 5,068, up 17.56 points, or 0.35%, and then closed at 5.022. The day before that one, we opened at 5.064, up 2.77, or 0.5%, and we closed at 5051. Monday, we opened at 5149 and closed all the way down at 5061. Last Friday, we actually opened down more than 27 points at 5175, but we still finished the day even lower at 5123. Yeah? Why do people keep making the same darn mistake? I think there's a widespread belief that you can still buy the dip. That's been the right move ever since the long-term interest rates peaked back in October. It's worked before, so they think it's going to work again. Well, that's really good thinking. Now, though, buyer, buying the dip is the quintessential wrong thing to do. It is just off the tracks, and I'm going to tell you why. First, bonds are char- in charge right now, not stocks. Bonds are in charge, and once again, the long-term interest rates are going higher like they did today, like they've been doing throughout this whole recent decline. Sure, there's been a flight to quality on some days, but we know that doesn't count. Ever since we started getting hot inflation numbers, the bond market's been doing the work of the Fed. Yet traders and investors just can't seem to resist because dip buying had been working. But it was only right when rates were going lower. It's wrong when rates are going higher because you are fighting the tape. Second, we don't have enough of what I've started calling Brown shoots. That's my name for signs of a slowdown, just like green shoots are signs of an acceleration. Brown shoots can come from companies with disappointing earnings. Later on the show, I'm going to walk you through the sudden downturn at Prologis, a gigantic real estate investment trust that's a global leader in logistics facilities. And J.B. Hunt, one of the nation's largest trucking companies. Brown shoots abound. I could uh, include two auto-related names, CarMax, the used car dealer, which blew up. When it reported and snap on tools, the reliable specialty tool company that sells to individual auto repair shops that lost an astounding 7.6 percent of its value on a rare earnings miss. The house of pain. But we don't have a lot of blow ups in the morning. So buyers figure hey, the coast is clear on most days. It isn't. There's no coast is clear call because we aren't trading on earnings right now. We're trading on fear and fear does not lead to great closes. Third. Not all stocks are created equal. We have what we used to call leaders, and the leaders, they are failing us. The biggest failure, Tesla, which is going down relentlessly in a totally scary pattern. House of pain. <laughs> How much will Tesla lose this quarter? That's a common refrain. How about that pivot to going into robo-taxi? Well, Hertz tried that going big with Teslas, and that failed. Why would that be any better for Tesla itself? The country's just not ready for self-driving cars. Instead, Americans want solid, inexpensive electric vehicles. Not expensive ones. Those are dumb. And they sure don't want Tesla's Cybertruck. I thought Elon Musk fanboys would buy it, but the darn thing has what I call no mojo. Maybe because it needs to be advertised? I don't know. I mean, perhaps Tesla needs to run a traditional pickup truck ad where some gravelly voice guy talks about ditching the Ford F-150 because the Cybertruck has bulletproof windows. I can't think of any other selling point. Best I can do. Next, jury leader is Apple. Now, I've said you should own it, not trade it. I'm not going away from that. But if I had to buy it, I'd right, right, either wait till the stock pulls back to 160 or at least wait until the company reports and then it cuts its forecast. What you need to know is that stocks have not been bottoming on estimate cuts in this market. They fall and then they fall again. 
Can Apple pull a rabbit out of a hat? Sure, anyone can. Elon Musk can too. But I don't see magic happening yet with Apple. Its dreariness is so powerful that it weighs on us every day. See, it cuts forecast, goes down, and maybe next day goes down as you get some uh, downgrades, and then it bottoms. That would be the pattern. Final devastating leader is my pal NVIDIA, which has a stock that can't find its footing. Even as it managed a small gain today, this is a very discerning market, and the rally in NVIDIA into its phenomenal GTC conference has been more than wiped out. Now, this is not a new pattern. NVIDIA tends to rally and then drift and go, go along, and then we get to the quarter, and it rallies again. Rinse and repeat. The difference this time? Your enemy, your fellow shareholders, who either don't know what NVIDIA does or is, or now believe that generative AI is a scam. The stock won't be safe until all these weak hands get washed out. Unfortunately, so many of these fellow travelers bought NVIDIA at the wrong time. They didn't experience the run. They came in late, and they have a real bad cost base. It's a terrible entry point. These are the people who cannot take the house of pain. The house of pain. They know nothing! Maybe market leader Netflix can break the scan of wounded leaders flailing in the market. as reported a good number this evening, but what has become a typical of the accentuate the negative pattern, the company's boilerplate warning about the future may be trans- eh, just being okay. Maybe that's transcending all the good news. Who knows? Fourth, we aren't getting any good aggregate data, and people don't seem to care. Well, that's wrong. They buy anyway. That's wrong. Why don't they realize that the data is in control, the CPI, the price deflator, the non-farm payroll report? Because the data determine the interest rates, and interest rates determine the stock market action right now. You cannot ignore the data anymore. You need some really weak economic market data to make the market go higher. Because Wall Street's desperate for a slowdown that would give the Fed an excuse to cut rates. It needs an excuse. It doesn't have one. Fifth. We keep ignoring the Middle East. And then when we get to Friday, we get scared to death that something will happen over the weekend and people dump everything. There's always something to worry about in this conflict. So the pattern keeps repeating itself. Now, what would happen if people stopped buying in the morning and instead sold big from the get-go? Sell, 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 That, friends, is what I've been waiting for. You're not going to get a bottom, a serious bottom, a lasting bottom until you have the big give up. The gigantic end of days decline where people just can't handle the house of pain at all. No the way. House of pain. They want a new address. They want the 5% CD address. The stock market address is just too horrendous. Don't buy, don't buy, don't buy. When you buy. get the vicious open, the down 1% or 2% abyss staring you right in the face, then the market has a chance to wrestle with terra firma. You need to have that what I call whoosh where we just crater at the opening. An abomination that includes lots of formerly bullish, now scaredy cat owners who don't want out, who they just went out so badly, they don't even care what price they get. Not only that, but the down opening doesn't mean a bottom for that day. For that, you need to have a true crescendo to follow the whoosh. Whoosh, then crescendo. Typically, that means you see a rally at the open, a whoosh down, and then machine gunners come in at those brave souls who try to buy the market, like the first day of the song. Then you get what I call the crescendo, just like in the music, where there's a colossal blowout that leaves people aghast, and you get a chance. The next day, the next day, you see the local news trucks with those weird antennae on the roofs. They'll have well-coiffed men or women with a mic in their hand, hanging around Wall and Broad Street, staring into a camera, trying to grab some bystander who'll talk to them about jumping off a building or something. You know, I used to go up to those people, and when they would ask me what I thought, I would say, hey, you know what? I think because you're down here, it means the market's bottoming. (laughs) Well, of course, my interviews never aired. Bottom line, when you get the news that the the trucks and the journalists asking people how they feel about losing fortunes in the stock market, that may mark the real bottom. Unfortunately, there's been no whoosh, no crescendo, and no local TV people with mics in their funny trucks. Until then, presume we have not yet bottomed. Hey, how about Matt in New Jersey? Matt. Hey, booyah, Jim. But yeah, Matt, not bad. I was in Philadelphia today. I had a good time. How about you? Very good. Very good. Uh, Excellent. The stock, the, st- the stock I am calling you about today is the American Airlines. Their earnings oh. are coming out next Thursday, and I would like to know if you think uh, I should add to my position now before they post the earnings or wait. And in your opinion, is American Airlines a buy, sell, or hold? Thanks okay, so let's, you know, we've got Delta pretty good numbers, and we have, um, without a doubt, United reporting great numbers. Will American continue that? I would tell you that American 14 is back to where it was, I mean, so, so long ago. Uh, you know what? I don't want to play uh, airline roulette, but I do believe that 14 bucks, down, I don't know, one down, two up. Hey, how about we go clear across the country to Jeff in California? Jeff. Hey, Jim, I'm in L.A. I'll get right to the point. 
I bought $8,000 worth of square or block three years ago. It's up 16% in one year. Bam. And in three years, it's down 71.3%. Ouch. So I'm minus $6,000 in three years, Jim. I have very little patience. I told my son, David, I'm not a doctor. I have no patience. Should I continue praying, Jim? I'm very spiritual. Or should I sell now? Bam. Okay, let's think about this. I happen to think the company can go higher. I like the last quarter. I know it's painful. I know that you don't have any patience. But can I ask for you to have fortitude? Because that's what it'll take. All right, once we get the new ch- trucks and the funny trucks and the things that about, and the journalists ask us how we feel about losing fortune in the stock market, that smells like a bottom, but unfortunately, we haven't seen that yet. Well, man, what do you think? If there's one thing you can count on during earnings season, it's that Wall Street will get some of them wrong. Tonight, I'm eyeing a charitable trust named Abbott Labs, one of the best companies in the business, telling you why the market may have misjudged this one all the way down. Then, are the package good stocks the whole package? Ha <laughs> ha! I'm taking a closer look at the comeback we're seeing in that space. And forget green shoots. You know what I'm eyeing? I'm eyeing the brown shoots that are being revealed by two major operators this earnings season and telling you what it means for the overall market. So stay with Kramer. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on X. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Mentions. Send Jim an email to madmoney at CNBC.com or give us a call at 1 800 743 CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com. The one constant about earnings season is that Wall Street's always making mistakes. There's so much information coming our way that people get sloppy. They react emotionally. They focus on the wrong things. And so a lot of results get misread, which leads to ridiculous and often wrong action in the stock market. Take Abbott Laboratories, the medical technology company that we own for the Travel Trust. I've been very confident in this one since we spoke to CEO Robert Ford at the big J.P. Morgan Healthcare Conference in January. Wanted to go down first. When Abbott reported yesterday morning, even though the company delivered a healthy beat and raised quarter, the stock still got slammed, pulling back roughly 3%. So, so, so. Nasty. What went wrong? Okay, this pick had been going very well for the CMC Investing Club until about a month ago when Wreck It Ben Keyser, a competitor, big maker of baby formula, lost a major lawsuit in Illinois, cast a poll in the entire industry, including Abbott Labs, which also makes formula. But I was hoping Abbott could turn the page on that story when it reported its first quarter results, because this is a very strong company, fantastic balance sheet. Just a a tremendous agglomeration of medical devices and medical instruments. A storied business. Sure enough, these guys delivered a huge sales and earnings beat as their core business, which excluded COVID sales, was up nearly 11%. Wall Street was only looking for 9.5%, so you get double-digit growth here. Abbott's medical device division in particular is on fire. Remember, tons of people delay getting non-urgent surgery during the pandemic, and there's still a huge backlog of patients who need these devices. This time, the star was their diabetes care business. I wasn't even looking for that to be the star. With 20.7% orga- organic growth, thanks to their popular blood sugar monitor, which is now getting more reimbursement coverage in Europe. Cardiovascular devices and structural heart devices were both up double digits as well. Holy cow. In other parts of the business, management highlighted new products in diagnostics. Abbott recently gained FDA approval for its iStat traumatic brain injury instrument which can tell if you have a concussion in just 15 minutes, even in a non-hospital setting. Think of all the uses for that, unfortunately. And then there's the cherry on top. Abbott raised the low end of its full-year forecast for organic revenue growth and earnings per share. And keep in mind, it's extremely rare to see this team raise guidance at all right after the first quarter. Ford noted on Abbott's call that this was the first time since 2016 that the company had done so. That was the signal to buy, buy, buy. So why the heck did the stock sell off anyway? There are a couple potential culprits. I'll point them out to you. Even though Abbott raised its full-year forecast, their guidance for the second quarter was thought to be a little light. I'm not worried about that at all. Some people are worried about the strong dollar hurting the company's overseas sales. Others say Abbott's COVID business was too strong, which obscures what's really going on. I mean, come on. I don't think any of that explains the pullback. In pre-market trading, for the call, Abbott's stock actually jumped a couple of points on the initial news, although it had given back those gains by the time the conference call started. 
Then about 20 minutes into the conference call, Abbott took a question from J.P. Morgan analyst Robbie Marcus. Marcus asked why Abbott was confident enough to raise guidance after just one quarter, and then he asked about the litigation concerns I just mentioned that have weighed on the stock since that record bank he's ruling in mid-March, even though the two companies have very different, not formulas, but labels. I think this resurfacing litigation worries is what weighed on Abbott's fears, which quickly fell to 104, down 4.5% in the first few minutes of trading yesterday. And once investors saw the stock was down, they just assumed that something must be very, very wrong with the quarter. So Abbott couldn't really recover yesterday. That's a typical uh, theme, by the way, of this particular earnings period. So the stock even fell a bit more today. For what it's worth, even ignoring the first part of CEO Robert Ford's answer, where he talked about how Abbott, the strong Abbott's businesses are, I thought his response to the litigation question was very thoughtful and even encouraging. Ford first offered a reminder of why the product in question, formula for premature infants, is seen as necessary by the medical community. He reminded investors that there are clinical studies that have, quote, repeatedly established that these products are safe, end quote, that the products have been in use for decades and that, quote, countless babies have benefited from these products with life-saving experiences, end quote, in many cases over many years. Ford claimed that the plaintiff's lawyers pursuing these cases are distorting the science and that their allegations are not supported by the medical community. Still, the fact that this issue came up right at the top of the calls Q&A, well, that was enough to overshadow Abbott's strong earnings. It's also possible that a couple of the data points that were raised by the J.P. Morgan analysts and Ford's response, including that there are about 1,000 cases that have been filed, with the first trials on this subject starting in July, might have been news to some investors, even if these facts were publicly available for yesterday, and we talked about them as members. Of the, if you remember the club, you knew about it. My view, look, our legal system can make things very difficult for businesses when there's a jury trial, especially in cases with highly sympathetic victims, like families of babies who got sick or even in some rare cases died. But lawsuits like this one are unfortunately par for the course when you're running a large medical company. More important, I think Abbott has a defensible position. As spelled out by Ford in his response to the J.P. Morgan analyst yesterday, don't forget, Abbott has the medical community on its side, and these baby formula products for premature infants are mostly used because they're recommended by doctors. You're not playing litigation roulette if you bet on Apple here. It's not like the J&J situation where the damage was endless because juries believe the plaintiff's lawyers who contend that J&J knew there was cancer-giving asbestos in its talc baby powder and didn't tell anybody and didn't take it off the market. Thanks to J&J, there's a great fear of litigation in the medical space. But again, J&J had 100,000 claimants on this issue, whereas there are only about 1,000 claimants for this premature baby formula. Uh, sure, Beckett and Rankeeser had to pay out the $60 million to a single family, a verdict that the company does plan to appeal. But Abbott Labs has much less exposure to this one than they do. When that verdict came down in March, a couple of analysts took a stab at figuring out how much damage this could do. And they figured it might be as much as $200 million to $300 million problem for Abbott over the course of many years. Meanwhile, Abbott's market capitalization has shrunk by over, two, over $23 billion since then. I think that's absurd. At the end of the day, I think you're getting a buying opportunity in this one. After yesterday's fabulous beat and raise quarter, it's clear that the bulls are right about Abbott Labs. The business is great, and they're not getting enough credit for it. At the same time, the baby formula litigation, while not something to ignore, feels very different from J&J because the company had a warning label, and it's been approved by doctors as life-saving nutrition. So the bottom line, I recommend using this mistaken emotional sell-off to buy more of this dividend aristocrat on weakness, which is exactly what we did for the Chapel Trust yesterday lowering our cost basis in the process. And if you don't own any Abbott at all, you can buy it more aggressively because this is the cheapest the stock has been all year. Mad Money is back after the break. Coming up, the total package? Kramer chomps down on the comeback in packaged foods. Next. Have the packaged food stocks finally come back into style in the Wall Street fashion show? After spending a couple years lost in the wilderness, we're finally seeing something positive here. Over the past few weeks, we've gotten good earnings from three high-profile packaged food companies, and wonder of wonders, their stocks actually rallied on the news. That may not sound like much, but there was an extended period of time where the food stocks couldn't get much lift, even from strong results. Why don't we take them one by one, starting with Hormel Foods, all right? 
This is the company best known for spam, although you might know them as Applegate Farms, Planners, and Skippy Peanut Butter, among other brands. Hormel reported a $0.07 cent earnings beat off a $0.34 cent basis at the end of February with meaningfully better than expected sales, and the stock immediately popped almost 15% in response. This was the first quarter of positive sales growth since mid-2022. Even though Hormel's retail and international businesses were, let's say, not so hot, their food service division was on fire, up 9.4% year-over-year. More importantly, Hormel's strength came from volume, not pricing. The total volume was up 3.7% year over year as the company rolled back some previous price increases. Still, Wall Street lopped it up Mm-mah! because the package, oh, tempting, because the last few years, the packaged food place mostly got their growth from raising prices, even at the cost of volume, which is not a sustainable strategy. Now, we did speak with Hormel CEO Jim Snee later that night, and he explained how the company's winning, not this way thanks to its focus on protein. Remember, these GLP-1 weight loss drugs, I just wanted the syrup anyway, cause people to lose muscle mass too, which is why doctors tell anyone who takes them to get as much protein as they can. Hey, by the way, I've been recommending Tyson, not the fighter, but the foods, for the same reason since last November. The stock's now giving you a nearly 23% gain. Holy cow, my smart. As for RML, I wouldn't be surprised if it's got more room to run. Okay, just try to get my teriyaki. Next, on March 20th, Generous Mills, as we used to call it on Wall Street. This is a darn good company, reported darn good quarter. And the stock rallied 1.2% in response. While the market's rolled over since then, Mills has just hung in there. Tough. As with Hormel, General Mills turned in a solid set of numbers, inline sales that were a couple of percentage points, better than expected at least, and a size learning speed. Unlike Hormel, though, this company's still stuck in the trap of raising prices to stabilize its growth, even as the expense of losing volume, which was down 2%. But it's all about the direction of these trends. That's the way it thinks on Wall Street. And the 2% volume decline, it was an improvement from a 4% volume decline in the previous quarter. Geez, you can't get any of this stuff off of them. The closer from Mills was the 12 cent earnings beat off a dollar or five basis. Their biggest earnings beat on a percentage basis point since mid 2020. And that was the height of COVID lockdowns when all we did was eat Cheerios. Management also reiterated most of the probably could open back then. Green are most of the key lines for its full-year forecast, which was enough to push the stock higher. Third example, ConAgra Brands. Dare I pick this one, ha, or that one, which turned in a robust quarter two weeks ago, and the stock jumped more than two, 5%. Hey, by the way, this was the best performer in the S&P 500 that day. Thank heavens. That day. And the company had that struggled to grow for ages, and that, frankly, is still struggling to grow. But we're finally seeing some improvement based on better volumes. ConAgra net sales decreased by 1.7%, although still came in a little better than expected. The company took a 0.2% hit on price mix, still experienced a 1.8% decline in volume. Doesn't seem exciting, but in the previous quarter, net sales were down 3.2%, thanks to a 0.5% hit from price mix and a 2.9% drop in volume. ConAgra is clearly missing in, clearly moving in the right direction. Fortunately, their margins came in better than expected, actually much better than expected, which translated into a healthy earnings beat. And management even raised their full year operating margin forecast. We spoke with ConAgra brand CEO Sean Connolly on the night of the report, and he painted an encouraging picture, explaining that the company's previous supply chain investments are now paying off in the form of cost savings. Those savings allow ConAgra to spend more on advertising and innovation which in then turn helped drive volume improvements while, without compromising margins. Listen to this. We're making progress for sure. The quarter unfolded largely the way we expected. Our supply chain did a terrific job generating cost savings, and that gave us the ability to invest in our business to drive volume, particularly in advertising, innovation, and merchandising. And we were pleased to report a quarter that saw continued volume progress, but importantly, while maintaining our gross margins. <laughs> In short, things are looking up for this 4.6% yield. That's, that's it. Whenever Wall Street seems to change its mind on an entire industry, there's more to it than just the results of the individual companies. So what allowed the packaged food place to get their mojo back? Anyone got a fire extinguisher? First, it's pretty clear that investors got too negative on the industry last fall when people were selling everything that might be theoretically threatened by the rise of the GLP-1 weight loss drugs. That episode created low expectations for the packaged food players that are now being cleared when these companies report. Hey, by the way, in the same interview two weeks ago, Sean Connolly told us there was zero impact from the GLP-1s. Second, 
there are some macro factors working in the whole group's favor right now. When you see the averages selling off because Wall Street's worried about the Fed won't cut interest rates, that usually coincides with investors swapping back into safety stocks, and few groups are safer than the packaged food stocks. Now, you can argue that the consumer packaged goods plays have mostly high yields. Uh, they should have been, uh, they actually hurt, right? Hurt by the re- recent rise in long-term interest rates, 70 basis points. Higher long rates make bonds look more attractive versus the dividend yields you can get from even the best food stocks. But that's not how it's playing out right now. People want safety stocks, and that's trumping everything else. That said, I'm more interested in the trends for the packaged food companies themselves. Having gone through these three quarters uh, for Hormel, General Mills, and ConAgra, we're seeing something new in the packaged food space. After a couple years where nearly all growth in this industry came from price hikes, we're finally seeing volume improvements. That's what we really want to see. That was easy. Even if volumes are still shrinking for some of these companies, they're at least shrinking at a slower pace, meaning the trend's headed in the right direction. Plus, it doesn't hurt that the food players are seeing some relief on the cost front, both naturally from lower commodity prices and from company-specific efforts to get their spending under control. The shrewder packaged food companies like ConAgra are using these cost savings to go on offense and try to take market share. Overall, it's an encouraging theme and a market that suddenly seems to be bereft of upbeat stories. Bottom line, we'll see if the packaged, stocks, packaged food stocks can keep running that's mostly a question of when the sector rotation ends. But with the bar set so low for many food plays, I wouldn't be surprised if the stocks can keep running simply because it doesn't take much for the underlying companies to beat the extremely low expectations. As long as they haven't had to give up too much of the pricing they gained during COVID, I think these stocks will continue to work their way higher, even though they're boring as all get out and could lull you to sleep. Then again, that's exactly what you want from a food stock. Why don't we take calls? Why don't we go to Armin from Florida? Armin. Hi, Jim. I'm a young investor looking to diversify. I'm all in on tech, which has done well for me. And now I want to look at Starbucks. All right. Fair enough. We own Starbucks for our travel trust. We are down badly on it. It's been a house of pain. I talk about it with Jeff Marks every single day. I literally do every single day. We feel when they miss the quarter, which they're probably going to miss, the stock's going to go down. And that's when we're going to be able to buy more because no stock that we know has rallied yet on an estimate cut. We could be wrong. Maybe they make the quarter. Then we will miss an opportunity to buy more. I think you wait till the quarter. That's my take. I'm just, uh, my nose is watering because this was so hot. Can I go to Chrissy in Massachusetts, please? Chrissy. Hello, uh, Jimmy. My, uh, I'm a student of Dr. Fiore's at Western State. My question is, would it be beneficial to invest in Krispy Kreme? Uh, it's, I think it's run. It's had a terrific move out of nowhere. And when you have a trip move out of nowhere, I mean, it's supposed to be because, like, uh, you know, some another package, another restaurant took up the chain's product. I think you got to just say, I missed it and move on. Now, I wouldn't be surprised one bit if the package food stocks keep running from here, given how low the bar is to clear expectations for this earnings season for the group. It's a hot one. Ha. Well, I mean, on the tongue. Now, there's much more bad money than beware the eyes of March. I'll reveal why the reports from two economic bellwethers are flashing warning signals when it comes to the strength of the overall economy. And is it time to get comfortable with harsh overhead lighting and co-workers microwaving fish in the break room? How the five-day work week is coming back into fashion at Kevin's. And all your calls rapid fire in tonight's edition of the Smoking Hot Lightning Round. So stay with me. Are we finally headed for a slowdown just when everybody's given up on the idea? As I said at the top, I'm looking for brown shoots wherever I can find them, and they're starting to pop up in important places. Look, if there's one thing people are confident about, including yours truly, it's the economy still humming. We talked about the banks yesterday, Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan, Citigroup, and the like, and we didn't hear anything from them to suggest that higher interest rates are having much of an impact yet, aside from making the banks more profitable. It's a solid moment, not a fabulous one, as Brian Jordan, the straight shooting CEO of First Horizon, told us last night, and he's from the hottest area of the country, the southeast. We've got a healthy amount of commerce and few defaults. This is certainly not what Fed Chief Jay Powell was looking to see, because in this environment, companies can raise prices too easily. That feeds the flame of inflation. I think he never would have committed to no more rate hikes if he had known that business was going to stay this strong. However, we got two companies this week that gave us a very different narrative, real wake-up call, a narrative that's rife with what I call brown shoots. 
We're getting these negative stories from excellent companies that are far more sensitive to media trends than the banks are, or pretty much any entity out there. The best examples, profoundly weak numbers from J.B. Hunt, the fourth largest trucker and perhaps the most uh, the boldest one when it came to expanding the last few years and highly disappointing results from Prologis, the largest owner of logistics real estate. Before I get into the numbers, let me just say two things here. Uh, both of these companies are superb operators. J.B. Hunt, run by outgoing CEO John Roberts, and the extraordinary incoming CEO, Shelley Simpson, has put together a true nationwide colossus. They took advantage of the COVID era to get much bigger. That was smart. Prologis, the landlord to e-commerce, regular commerce, data centers, even solar fields, is about as steady a predictor of the economy as you can find because they own the warehouses. It was the first stock to rally out of the Great Recession is total control of its business. Or at least I thought it did until yesterday. To say that both of these companies were surprised by how slow their disparate markets have become may be uh, the understatement of the year. One month ago, to the day, Hamid Mogadon, the brilliant clinical CEO of Prologis, came on this show and told a very positive story. VC activity is very strong, even as new supply was coming online. Maybe too much supply, maybe not. Demand looks strong, e-commerce was strong. The only weak area in the whole country was Southern California. Prologis doesn't make forecasts, but management did say there could be a small decline in rents because of an oversupply concentrated in Southern California. But their projections were very solid. A a solid quarter, very good year. 30 days later, and now those predictions are out the window. Their occupancy rate was 75 basis points lower than what Hamid expected just a month ago. That is, my friends, a monster slashing. Although Hamid made it clear on the conference call that this decline might be temporary. Now, Prologis is no longer just talking about a slowdown in Southern California. He even expanded what I thought Southern California meant, mostly Inland Empire, and includes now New Jersey, Seattle, and Savannah. That's a huge change for just 30 days of this extremely well run company, isn't it? J.B. Hunt's much worse. January started okay, up 2% in sales. Then things sped up to up 3% in February. But March, down 1%. Down! That's a pretty steep deceleration and a not-so-hot cadence out of the quarter. If anything, that understates it because the pockets of weakness are very weak. J.B. Hunt saw a 22% downturn in its logistics line. The core truckload business is down 13%. Buy was down 5%, which is a bad sign for the rest of the economy. Prices are coming down in trucking and discounts are going up in warehouses. Warehouses that are used by the likes of Amazon, Home Depot, FedEx, DHL, Maersk, and UPS. There's some real brown shoots staring at us. The culprit in each case is overbuilding, and that is exactly what Chief Pal had been hoping for. J.B. Hunt tells the story well. Listen to Darren Field, the president of Intermodal, which was very weak. Quote, after not having enough capacity to meet our demands in 2021 and 2022, we have consistently been growing our capacity, end quote, to meet their customers' demands. And now there is a surfeit of trucks because everyone else overbuilt, too. Suddenly, in an industry that didn't have enough capacity, there's too much capacity. Similar case with Prologis. Not long ago, there was a developing shortage in warehouses. So just like J.B. Hunt, Prologis and its rivals built them like crazy in order to meet the demand. But so did so these speculative merchants, that's what Prologis calls them, betting that there's no limit to that demand. Who would want to bet again on the growth of e-commerce and data centers? Now that demand is slow, though, uh, these speculators suddenly find themselves on the ropes. As Amin explained, Quote, they don't have the financial wherewithal, end quote. And he says they're so distressed that he senses bargains because they may have no choice but to sell. Which brings me to the implications of these two reports. And yes, for the first time in this rate hike cycle, I see light at the end of the tunnel just when others see the light of an oncoming train. All aboard! Before there are bargains for prologists, there will be free rent enticements for the customer. Before it turned in trucking, there will be cuts in trucking rates. Both very positive. Those, these companies are experiencing what's supposed to happen in the business cycle after the Fed tightens 11 times. The truckers see great things from their customers, so they go all in, which means the trucking companies start getting big orders, which means the trucking suppliers perk up. The professional companies that build data centers and e-commerce warehouses see speculators move in to siphon off e-commerce business. Meanwhile, they're all putting in orders by pipe from Ferguson and electronics from Vertib and Eaton. Then the customers, presumably the big e-commerce companies, see a slowdown, which quickly leads to a situation where we've got too much warehouse space. The truck builders see their orders cut severely. They all frantically cut prices themselves, allowing the Fed to beat inflation in this domino situation and putting us in a situation where J-PAL can start cutting rates before there are big layoffs and bankruptcies. However, this time, the chain of pain simply didn't happen. No one's going belly up. We can't see any major players filing for bankruptcy. We haven't seen any orders canceled. We don't see the price cuts down the line to move product. So do we finally have the beginning of the long-awaited slowdown with Prologis and J.B. Hunt? Was March that bad? 
All I can say is that at least there's some brown shoots somewhere. But the bottom line is it's not enough to cause the Fed to reconsider what they were saying just a couple of days ago. Man Money's back after the break. Coming up, hit us with your best shot. An electrified fast fire lightning round is next. It is time to the lightning round. Remember, that's where you fall apart for everyone. It's hitting this stock. So, bye bye bye. So, typically, under the course, you don't know if you play this out. And then the lightning round is over. Are you ready, Ski Daddy? Time for the lightning round. Let's we'll start with Doug in New Jersey. Doug! Oh, big booyah from Point Pleasant at the Jersey Shore. Ah, Jenkinson's beckoning. Let's go. Let's go to work. Come on. Yeah. All right. Long time listener, first time caller. I bought the stock and the Biden administration approved the Willow Project in Alaska. Even though it's not online yet, it's run up 20%. Should I buy, sell, or hold ConocoPhillips? I want you to hold ConocoPhillips. I like Chevron, too. And my favorite is Cotera for the Travel Trust. I need to go to Michael in Massachusetts. Michael. I typically have thought of this company. They're in trials of obesity drugs. They are Rhythm Pharmaceutical. Oh, Rhythm Pharm. Okay, look, the speculative play actually has some obesity work. I am not against speculating biotechs right now. It looks like that there's so many bids, I'm willing to let a stock catch fire. Mark in Florida. Mark. Hey, Jim, I appreciate you taking my call. I'm oh, calling about you. Marvell Technology, and it's been dropping ever since they had last Thursday's AI conference. Is now the time to buy more, or should I hold? Okay, uh, this is in a very difficult cohort. I thought Matt Murphy told a great story. I would buy some and then wait till under 60 to buy the rest. Let's go to Minal in Georgia. Minal. Hey, jo- hey Jim. Hi. Go ahead. Yeah, you got Jim. Yeah, sure. You're up. Yeah. Uh, so I'm interested in LRCX, Lamb Research Corp. Uh, okay. Production technology stock. Is right. Now, I'm time? worried about Lamb. Look, I like Lamb very much. I do think that right now we're uh, having a pause in that group in the capital equipment, especially after what I saw Taiwan Semi do after report it. Let's wait till that stock goes lower and we'll feel better. Let's go to Juan in New York. Juan. Jimmy, Buya Jimmy. Listen, I love it. In a big corporation, E N B X. What did you say? You like it? You don't like it? Because I, I, I know I, it. I look, look I gotta tell you, you gotta be making some money in that business. If you're not making any money in that business, then I can't say to buy the stock. Let's go to Corey in Washington. Corey. Hey Jim, I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts today. Sure, thank you. Um, I've been monitoring this company that has had some interesting developments and strategic shifts in recent years. Okay. Um, that, the company. that stock is that stock is Western Union. I have not looked at Western Union since I spoke to them when I was at Dreamforce many years ago. So here's what we're going to do. I promise you that we're going to do a homework on it because I never understood why the dividend could be so big and the stock be so low. Let's do some work and we will come back. Thank you. Let's go to John in Virginia. John. Hey, John. Hey, hey, Jim. Thanks for having me on. No problem. Um, wanted to get your advice on Aspen Aerogels. I bought them about a year ago. It's done pretty well. But I feel like a, a lot of the buzz behind the rally of the past year was tied to the potential growth of the EV market. Do you think I should hold on to it or sell because of the lack of momentum right now? With this EV? thing is up so big. And what a great opportunity to sell the stock of a money-losing company after you've made a lot of money. Take, it, take the profit. Guadalupe in New York, uh, Guadalupe. Hey, Jim. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Question. So back in November of 2020, uh, I purchased a stock with your blessing, um, uh, and I have made over 200% on that stock. My question is, should I buy more, sell, or hold? It's uh, McKesson. Oh, man, don't sell McKesson. Don't sell Sencora. I mean, these things are unbelievable. These are the middle people. And by the way, let's just throw in Cardinal. That's a threesome. I'm giving you a threesome. You can bet. You got to get a threesome. I got once. I got twice. I got three. Let's go to Ronald Massachusetts. Ronald. Hello, Mr. Kramer. How are you today? I am good. How about you? Oh, I'm pretty good. I'm a longtime listener, morning and evening, and have made money from your recommendations. I would like your opinion on the PNC Bank. All right, people didn't like the PNC quarter. I, on the other hand, felt that it was an enjoyable quarter, meaning that they're going to start enjoying it again and come back to it. So you buy some now and you buy some down 10%, and you will have a third position that will last for a very long time. Joe in New Jersey. Joe. 
Hey, how's it going, Jim? Shout out to my dad watching Seltzer PA. We're both longtime fans of the show. The stock I want to ask you about is Vale. It's got a 6.5 PE, pays a 14% forward dividend, and is pretty much at its 52-week low. With potential tariffs on Chinese steel, what do we think will be the impact there? And would you consider Vail? It's too low to sell. It's too low to sell. I would say Vail, and then they have to cut the dividend, so that's no, nothing to bank on. But down here, I'm going to be able to take a shot at it, and I think I'll make some money and that. Ladies and gentlemen, the conclusion of the Lightning Round. The Lightning Round is sponsored by Charles Schwab. Coming up, Kramer weighs in on competition and the work week. Next. So Choice Financial is the latest alpha to order people back to work five days a week. It's only the investment bankers. The rest of the workforce needs to come in four days, uh, up in three days before the announcement. So what you say, come on already, send everyone back. Let's see who likes working at Choice and who doesn't. Good riddance to those who don't show up, as there are plenty of jobs elsewhere. In the meantime, the large regional banker in the southeast can start figuring out how to replace as many of these jobs with AI as soon as possible. Look, I'm not a Martinet, but this vestige of COVID simply doesn't make sense to me. I'd love to know how much money the Chuas even saved on rent. I'm fascinated by the idea of Zoom mentoring, something that happened because the bosses didn't come in. It was their rebellion. Yes, the bosses, not the younger people, to cause this work-from-home absurdity. The managers wanted to be at home. I'm sure the younger people, uh, they got a kick out of it. Uh, but coming in was never a deal-breaker for them. I'd love to see what these absent folk watched when they were at home. Did they binge on White Lotus? They predict maybe who won Squid Games? Or how about pro- the proxy fight in succession? Do they relax while watching Yellowstone? Or do they just play Wordle and Connections and while away the hours betting on DraftKings? How did it happen that people didn't go back to work when the pandemic ended? I do have a theory it's a surprising one derived from genuine homespun research that comes from doing my job. Plus, I'm a dad. The soft work week happened because the surprising cohort didn't want to go back. It's the cohort that's in their 40s and 50s who realized they were missing a part of life that they didn't get the office. They got to attend their kids' games. They saw their play performances. They played Roblox with them. They taught them. This was the generation that refused to look back and say, I wish I would have spent more time with my kids. Something I sure wish I'd done. I'll never forget the time when I missed my daughter play field hockey goalie against the best in the state uh, or the shutout of one of 18 she had in a championship game. No, both occurred on big days that were bad for the market. Or at least they felt like big days at the time. I know this. They were forgettable days. All of me just days I felt I should be at work because it was a dicey time in the market. And days my bosses felt were too important to miss. They weren't. I can't even recall what happened. Meanwhile, I'm sure I never would have forgotten some of those milestone wins or that championship game. I, I was just doing my job. I, I wish I hadn't. So I understand the rebellion by the people in their prime working years with school-aged children. That's what work from home is all about. I have no illusions. The whole productivity improves shams one giant charade. To think that truest workers can do as well for truest in three days as in five is just nonsense. But to think that those people, the executives, saw their kids' games, caught the plays, that's terrific for their life experience. At my hedge fund, I infamously tried to order a partner back to the office because Intel was reporting, even though his kid was in a play. I said that the kid's going to be in a million plays, but Intel only reports four times a year. That was wrong. I now believe in flexible moments. Uh, if you can, you should go to the games. You should try to get to them. But never forget where the five-day work week came from. A century ago, people worked six days a week. The labor movement got that down to five days. But five was the fewest days a company could allow in order to teach the next generation of leaders and do best for their shareholders, not to mention keep their customers happy. If you don't do these uh, three things, your business won't stay competitive over time. Oh, and one more thing. Work is life's biggest compromise. You agree to do it, and what comes with it is the corrupt bargain where you give up a lot of what you might otherwise want to do in exchange for the money you and your family need to live on. Fact of life, nobody's going to pay you to see your daughter's field hockey game. You aren't getting health insurance from watching a high school play. You can end the bargain. You can find a place that's not competitive. But if you work in a place like that, your employer might not make it because business is, in the end, about the survival of the fittest. They don't call it work for nothing. I like to say there's always a bull market somewhere. I promise I'd find it just for you right here at Mad Money. I'm Jim Cramer. See you tomorrow. Last call starts now. 
All opinions expressed by Jim Cramer on this podcast are solely Cramer's opinions and do not reflect the opinions of CNBC, NBC Universal, or their parent company or affiliates, and may have been previously disseminated by Cramer on television, radio, internet, or another medium. You should not treat any opinion expressed by Jim Cramer as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of his opinion. Cramer's opinions are based upon information he considers reliable, but neither CNBC nor its affiliates and or subsidiaries warn its completeness or accuracy, and it should not be relied upon as such. To view the full Mad Money Disclaimer, please visit cnbc.com forward slash Mad Money Disclaimer.